Thank you for tuning in today at Propel Church. Whether you're watching through YouTube or listening through a podcast, we want to say thank you. Our hope at Propel is that you would be propelled into an authentic relationship with Jesus. From wherever you are tuning in, we hope that you are encouraged and inspired by this week's message. Well, it's going to be a fun morning today because we are kicking off a brand new series called Don't Take the Bait. And uh, I'm really excited about this series. As I was looking at it, I really wanted to teach our church about temptation. And there's what I would call baits. There's things that the enemy will throw at us sometimes in our life that we need to learn how to not take the bait. Turn to somebody and say, don't take the bait. Come on, you're, you're, by the end of this message, you're going to be great at this, I promise. And so, but man, we, we talk about this uh, from time to time. It's a joke that Pastor Matt and I have with each other. It's that, hey, don't take the bait. And so what happens is when you and I are living our lives, the enemy will offer up something, some sort of temptation. Maybe you get cut off in traffic. And it, when I get cut off, I might get a little aggressive, you know, for just a second. And Pastor Matt will be like, hey, don't take the bait. And so we'll laugh. It's a very funny way to do it. Tori and I did it several times this week. When you have the opportunity to teach on things like spiritual warfare, you're going to have plenty of opportunities to, uh, to there's going to be plenty of bait offered. Let's say it like that. And so there were a couple of times this week we looked at each other and we were like, don't take the bait. You know, like we're not going to fight, you know? And, and so there's times where in our life, the enemy offers us up temptation. I experienced this uh, Thursday night. Tori and I went, we had a great dinner. It was, uh, we went to a steakhouse in Charlotte. And then afterwards we went over to uh, South Park Mall because Tori was like, I don't have a pair of Jordans. And I was like, girl, I need to get you a pair of Jordans, you know? (laughs) So we went to South Park Mall. And as we were there, uh, I looked at her and I was like, babe, like I'm I'm feeling some temptation right now in this particular part of the mall. And so we're walking and I was like, look, I'm just going to avoid it. And here's what I was avoiding. There was this stand where they were selling Girl Scout cookies. (laughs) And and I'm just, I mean, look, if you don't know about the do-si-do or the tag along, come on, if you're a thin mint person, prayer is going to be available during the fourth song. But man, I was really tempted. I've, I've been, I wanted Girl Scout cookies and I saw them. I went to the smoke pit for a meeting the other day and there they were with their little table, you know? I was like, no, Tori's on this new diet. I'm not gonna bring Girl Scout cookies into the house. I wanna honor my wife. And, and so, uh, I, so I avoided it in that moment and Tori was like, no, you should get it. And sometimes your, your spouse says that and you're like, does that really mean? <laughs> Come on now, you've been there, right? But then we were in the mall and, and, and she was like, babe, it's a stand. Girl Scout, you should get it. And I was like, no, I'm going to practice self-control. You know, so we walk past, go in the store, we get what we need. And right as we go to exit, I need to use the restroom. And she's like, no problem. I'll wait for you out here. Well, she sits where I have to cross the Girl Scout cookie table. And there was this, as I was crossing, this little girl named Abigail came up to me and yeah, yeah. You know where the story ends, right? And I ended up, I bought some Girl Scout cookies because at this point, the Girl Scout cookies weren't for me. I wanted to make Abigail's day. And uh, I bought the Girl Scout cookies. And so I, what happened is I, there was a bait. I ended up taking it. And right, that's a funny way to describe what happens in our life sometimes. And sometimes temptation that we experience is funny. Spouses, you may have the temptation to fight with your wife. It's a bad idea, right? Don't take the bait. Others of us have temptations to do all kinds of things, but but a lot of times temptation is a lot more serious. Maybe you get angry and the temptation you begin to feel is to lash out and yell at your kids. And you know you don't want to do it, but for some reason it just keeps coming up over and over again. Or maybe that's not the temptation you experience. Maybe your temptation is that after a really hard week of work, you come home and just wanna go to the fridge and grab a couple beers or grab some pills to kinda cope with the situation. Maybe your temptation is to be dishonest on a timesheet or to look at someone lustfully. There's a plethora of things that the enemy is gonna throw our way. And through this series, what I wanna do is help you and I not take the bait. 
And so before we go into some temptations that we're going to experience, and we're going to talk about one next week that I think is really going to help you and I in our life, I wanted to make sure we understand how the enemy works. Because baits just don't, they don't magically appear. They come from a source. And if you don't understand the source, you'll never get to the solution. And so if you have a Bible, go with me to James chapter... One beginning in verse 13. If you don't have a Bible, at the end of the worship experience today, if you're in person, do me a favor, stop by the new here tent. We've got Bibles we'd love to give you for free. And I know you may have a Bible at your house, but if you can't read it, it don't do you any good. And so we'd love to give you a Bible you can read free of charge just as, because we want you to have access to God's word. But if not, it's going to be available on the screen beside me. This is what it says in James Chapter one, verse 13, it says, when tempted, no one should say God is tempting me for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. Then after the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin when it's fully grown gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, dear brothers sisters. James chapter 1, 13 through 15. James is starting out this passage of text and he wants to make sure that you and I understand something foundational. Now, sometimes when we read scripture, we kind of look up and go, I don't really know what he's trying to say there, right? You ever been there when you read your Bible? Just me. Okay, cool. No, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Sometimes I read scripture and I go, I don't really know what they're trying to say there. But this one in particular, I've got a pretty good grasp because James kind of comes out in verse 13 and says, when tempted, no one should say God is tempting me for God cannot be tempted by evil. So first thing I'm going to teach you this morning is that temptation does not come from God. If we don't understand where temptation comes from, then we're never going to be able to find the solution to when we experience it. James wants to make sure we know that temptation does not come from God. And if it doesn't come from God, it must come from the enemy, Satan, our adversary, the one whose goal in our lives is to steal, kill, and destroy. That's where temptation comes from. But if temptation doesn't come from God, what does God give us? And you could go back to verse 12 and you could find that Temptation comes from the enemy, but testing comes from God. See, the goal of temptation is to get you to sin, while the goal of testing is to get you to persevere. See, James chapter 1 verse 12 says, blessed is the one who perseveres, for once he has endured the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised for him. This is not a test as in pass or fail. You know, God wants you to succeed. He wants you to thrive. He wants you to be blessed. But oftentimes, our greatest blessing comes after our greatest crushing. There's hardships that you're going to have to endure and go through. But the goal of a test is that you succeed and you persevere and you receive all that God has for you. While the goal of temptation is that the enemy brings us to a place where we sin and isolate ourselves from God. And to find out where temptation begins, we honestly have the opportunity to go back to the first couple chapters of the Bible. And in Genesis chapter three, we see the first story of temptation in scripture. And this is what it says. It says that the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. And one day he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now, if you aren't familiar with what happens in Genesis chapter one or two, let me bring you up to speed really quick. In Genesis chapter one and two, God creates everything, heavens, earth, birds, man, woman, and he says it's good. There's one portion where he says it's not good and that was for man to be alone. Then he creates Eve out of Adam's side. They are in communion with God. Everything is good perfect. We get to Genesis chapter three, and now a serpent enters into the picture to depict the devil to us. And his question to the woman is, did God really say you must not eat from any of the trees in the garden? And Eve's response was, well, no, he didn't really say that. Now, this is like a helpful thing in temptation 
If you'd quit talking to the enemy, you wouldn't be tempted as much. But, but, but here's what happens. If you don't learn the voice of God, you'll never be able to discern the voice of the enemy. Because we got to know what truth is so that we know what a lie looks like. So the enemy offers her, says, did God really say that? She said, well, no, this is, God didn't say we couldn't eat from any of the trees. In fact, he said we could eat from all the trees in the garden, except in the middle of the garden, there's these trees that we can't eat from. And he said, if we eat from it, then surely we would die. And the serpent comes back. And this is, this is actually, I'm giving you the paraphrase. This is the Nick Newman translation of <laughs> verse two, three, four, and five. So then the serpent comes back and says, well, God didn't really say that because he wouldn't kill you. No, God's actually trying to keep something from you. He knows that if you eat from that tree, you'll become just like him, knowing all things. And then this is what it says in verse six of Genesis chapter three. The woman was convinced. When we look at temptation, it's not that the enemy just tempts us. His goal is to convince us. The enemy doesn't create. Only God is creative. But what the enemy does do is he manipulates. He twists, he distorts, he perverts. And in this moment, he's taken what God said, he's twisted it just a little bit, and now he's convinced Eve that the tree that God said not to eat from, which was pretty specific, don't eat from the tree, now, well, she's convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and the fruit looked delicious. Uh, I'd say it like this. Look, if you're sinning and it's not desirable and like you're not having fun, I think you're sinning wrong. Like sin, sin's fun. It's desirable. It looks pleasing and delicious. She ate, she wanted the wisdom that it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and she ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it too. And at that moment, their eyes were opened and they suddenly felt shame at their nakedness. So they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. When the cool of the evening breeze was blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking around in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. And then the Lord God called out to the man and said, where are you? Now, when God comes into the garden, he's not asking Adam and Eve where they are because he doesn't know geographically where they're located. But what sin does for all of us is that it creates separation between us and God. We are divided. There's a gap between where we are and where God wants us to be. So the separation there, God's saying something's different. You were created and made in perfection. There's these things that we talked about. Honestly, they're not rules. They're standards. Don't eat from the tree. And then you did it. Now there's a shift. But Satan's goal and what Satan does has been the same thing throughout all generations. Because again, he doesn't create. He's crafty. He's not creative. He just runs the same game plan, which is this. Satan's scheme is to cause us to first question God. So just like he did with Eve, what did God really say? Now, this is the question that a lot of people are proposing even today. We're looking at scripture and we're looking at all the things God said. And, and rather than reading them as standards that God has given us, we're going, yeah, but you know, contextually, it meant something different. Or, or, you know, I know that's what it says, but if you look back at the Greek and Hebrew, in all honesty, it's going to say the exact same thing, but that's, that's okay. What people do is they twist it, they manipulate it, they distort it. And then what's happening is we are trying to redefine truth. We're trying to look at what God said and go, well, he didn't really mean it that way, even though there's clear distinctions between what God deems is right and what he deems is wrong. And what it does is it causes us to question what God has deemed a standard. Now, here's what I want to say. I'm not saying that you shouldn't have questions about God or that you can't ask questions about God. I think God is big enough to handle your questions. But when it comes to the truth of his word, can I tell you something that I think is really dangerous? We've got a lot of people right now who are using the excuse, but God told me in private things that contradict his word that he's given us. And whenever we do that, here's what's happening. We are redefining what our standard of morality is. And can I tell you, I've been hanging out with me long enough to know I'm probably not the guy to define morality for you. 
I'm probably not the person who needs to rewrite the book because I've got faults and flaws and I've got issues of my own. So when we look to God's word, it is our standard for ethics. It's our standard for morality. We don't get to twist it, manipulate it, pervert it, or distort it. We can have questions about God, but we're not going, well, God, you said this was what we shouldn't do. Well, is that really what you meant? Because after that, we end up sinning. And then the byproduct of that is that we feel guilty. They immediately felt shame at their nakedness. Then what they do? They sewed fig leaves together. So they try and cover it up. You ever been there where you make a mistake and then your whole goal is to figure out how to make sure nobody else finds out? Cover it up. And then they ended up hiding. Because if you don't deal with sin appropriately and run to the foot of the cross, what you'll end up doing is you'll hide from the very God who died for the sin you just did. So they hide. And if you keep reading on in chapter three, you'll get down just a little bit. And then when God starts to talk to them about this mistake that they've made, he goes, well, how'd you know you were naked? And Adam goes, Lord, it was that woman you gave me. Not a good plan, you know? <laughs> then Eve says, well, it was that serpent you created. And what's happening is they're just shifting blame. That's right. That's right. Rather than taking ownership, like, yeah, we, we, we did. It's, hey, it was their fault and their fault and their fault. And that's really what we do. Yeah. We feel guilty. We feel shame. We try and cover it up. We hide. We blame others. This is Satan's scheme. But as I was thinking through this, it really started to, take me back to the passage in James chapter one, verse 14, which taught us each person is tempted when they're dragged away by their own evil desires. So so I started thinking about Eve in the garden. And while she was created in perfection, God gave Eve and Adam free will to choose and decide. And somewhere inside of Eve, there was this longing and desire for more. There was this longing and desire, like maybe is God withholding something from me? And when that desire was there, the enemy just poured gasoline on a dead fire. And so as soon as something sparked up, Eve took the bait because Satan only tempts us with what we deem desirable. If you want to, this, I'll tell you, this will help you more in your life because instead of feeling guilty and shameful every time you experience temptation, what if you saw it as an opportunity to realize that, oh man, there's probably some desires I have that I should deal with. Satan only tempts you with what you deem desirable. And so as I was thinking about this message, I was, uh, two weeks ago, I was fly fishing on the Davidson and, um, that's where I encounter the Lord, you know? And, uh, so I was fishing and I had just come off of two days where I caught zero fish. And, uh, can I tell you, I didn't want to talk to anybody. You know what I'm saying? Like I was mad at the world. Hey, I was super mad. But then I remember that, uh, there's this concept in fly fishing called match the hatch. And it's really important because what happens is you go out first thing in the morning and at the beginning of the morning, there is the first hatch of the day. It's where all the bugs come to life. And what you do as you fly fish is you look at all the bugs that are around and you try and find what's landing on the water because whatever the hatch of the day is, it's like the buffet for trout, you know, like they're going to eat whatever God has created them to be blessed with for that day. So the term that they use is called match the hatch. Turn to somebody and say, match the hatch. So as they match the hatch, what they do is you you find the bug that is hatched for the day, and then you look in your fly box and you try and find the fly accordingly. So here's my first example for you. Uh, This is a mayfly. And so that bug would be hatched. Don't you like how high resolution of a photo I got? No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) That's a thank you, Google, right? So you got a mayfly right there. And then I'd open my fly box and I would find some with a hook on it (laughs) that looked very similar. So you'd throw that in the water. And if the trout want it, they're going to eat it because trout just eat what they desire. 
There's another one I'll show you. It's called a larva midge. It's a little grosser, but there you go. Come on, for some of y'all queasy. Now I'll tell you, I caught about 10 trout on one of them little buggers the other day. So it was, uh, it worked mighty fine. So, but what happens is, is that as you look at the hatch, as you look at what trout deem desirable for the day, you pick out the right bait and then you just give them what they want. And so as I was standing on the river, I was like, Dang, man, this is exactly what the enemy does in our life. Wow. Yeah. Is, is he has a really good way of just matching the hatch of our own heart. Yeah. Because he schemes and he prowls and he steps back and he watches. And once he finds out what we desire, he's not just going for some of you. You have like greed is not your issue at all. So he's not throwing money your way. Others of you, you're like, please throw money my way. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> But Satan's only going to offer you what you deem desirable because he's matched the hatch. He just looks at what you want and then he offers it to you. And when we take of it over and over and over again, we end up missing out on all that God wants for us in our life because all we're doing is satisfying and gratifying our flesh over and over and over again. So for some of you, maybe it looks like uh, what you really long for and desire is to have the approval of other people. And so you post on social media a couple times a day and you notice that your two o'clock post is underperforming your four o'clock post, right? (laughs) What is the enemy doing? He's just matching the hatch. He's just looking at what you deem desirable and He's showing things on your timeline where you're going, how'd they get 500 likes on a picture of their dog? Their dog is ugly. You know, like, (laughs) what's he doing? He's just offering up what you deem desirable. And maybe that's not your issue at all. Maybe you struggle with lust. And so all your friends are talking about a specific TV show and you start watching it, not realizing there's a ton of nudity in it. And Satan's just matching the hatch. He's just consistently giving you what you deemed desirable. And so if that's what the enemy does, if he just looks at what we desire and he offers it to us, how do we overcome it? I got 12 minutes to tell you. And so the question becomes, how do we change our appetite? How do you change your appetite? Because if it's what we desire, then rather than just running from temptation and avoiding temptation for the rest of my life, I should probably change what I want to eat. I should probably shift my appetite because as a follower of Jesus, you're called to be a victor, not an avoider. And I think sometimes in temptation, we just spend our whole life running from it instead of confronting it. I want to punch Satan in the face during this series. You know what I'm saying? Like I won't kick his teeth in. And to do that, to do that, I got to quit running from everything and I got to confront it head on. And so how do we change our appetite? This is not a dieting message, right? Somebody else is going to have to teach that one. Here's two things for you. Hey, hey, now you ain't got to laugh that hard. (laughs) Come on. I'm just kidding. Heaven, get that six pack in Jesus name, new body. How do we change our appetite? I got two things for you. Number one, quit making excuses for your sin. Yeah, so I didn't tell you I was going to come out swinging this morning, right? Like... Quit making excuses for your sin. One of the greatest uh, mentors in my life, I sat down with about seven years ago and uh, he had given me homework from the last time we met. And so when we sat down, he was like, hey, do you have that stuff I asked you for? And I was like, well, man, you know, like I've been working a lot this semester and, you know, I'm, you know we're, we're doing this thing called a church plant and it's a little busy. I got meetings with people. I've been doing all of these stuff. And I just was telling him excuse after excuse after excuse. And he looked at me and he said, that's great, Nick, but here's what I want you to know. The excuse only satisfies the teller. And, and I was like, well, I wish my excuses satisfied you, you know? <laughs> but it was, it was one of those words for me that really transformed the way that I lead and transformed the way that I live because no excuse is good enough. And at the end of the day, I think sometimes we come to God and he said, hey, this is a sin issue that I want you to get rid of. This is something you don't need in your life anymore. And you're like, God, do you know that like, I, this is my outlet. Like I need this right now. And what God is trying to say is if there's anything you need more than me, you have an idol and you should get rid of it. Hey, you got to quit making excuses for stuff that when God has said, hey, this is sin. It's not one of those things that we're like, Oh, you know what? 
I'll get rid of it later. Or maybe next week, I'll try harder next time. Like, what if we quit making excuses for sin? Because what I've learned over the years is that you can't feed something and defeat something at the same time. If you're trying to get rid of it, you're going to have to quit feeding it. You're going to have to quit giving in and going through the motions of just coddling the thing that God has very clearly told you to get rid of. I don't know what you make excuses for, but here's what I do know. If you'll quit making excuses for your sin, you will experience more of God than you ever have in your entire life. Because at the end of your excuses is his provision, his grace, and his faithfulness. If we would stop trying to, well, God, you know, if they wouldn't be so rude, I wouldn't have had to cuss them out. No, like, come on. <laughs> hey, look, at the end of the day, you're responsible for your actions. That's right. That's right. At the end of the day, you can't blame anybody else for the choices or the decisions you make. Even men, I was having a conversation with somebody the other day, and the conversation was, well, you know, I wouldn't look at X, Y, Z if my wife would just, no, bro. No. No. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like, you're responsible for your decisions. Yeah. We got to stop making excuses for sin. I love how Paul puts it in Romans chapter 13. This is what he says. He says, let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness and sexual immorality, sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh to gratify its desires. As Paul is teaching to the Roman people, he's talking to them and he says, let us walk as in the daytime. Because what would happen culturally is that once it got to be the night, everything changed. Like there were some people who looked really good and really put together in the daytime. But as soon as nighttime happened, man, they were out partying. They were living different. They were doing all of these things. Paul says, hey, what if we walked in the night just like we did in the day? Like, you know, because, because what you do when nobody can see is just important as what you do when everybody can see. So I don't, it's probably not a daytime, nighttime issue for most of us. But can I tell you what you do alone matters? What you do when nobody looking is matters because character is cultivated in places where nobody sees. And then platform just gives a spotlight to what you've been preparing for in the background. We need to be people who walk in the daytime and in the nighttime the same way. But Paul says the way we do that is we make no provisions. We don't give opportunities. We, take the, we make the decision to not create margin or space to gratify the flesh. Now, if you wonder what is the flesh, it's a very popular term in scripture. The flesh is just a, another way to say our sinful nature. So those sinful things that we desire, Paul says, put on the Lord Jesus and just quit making provisions. Don't Make allowances for those sinful desires, that sin nature that you have. For some of you, if you struggle with pornography and you realize that, hey, at the end of the day, uh, when you are home alone, that's when you're most tempted, there's probably going to be a season where you don't, you're not home alone anymore. Why? Because you're not making provisions for the flesh. For, for some people, it's getting rid of a cell phone because you have access to way too many things on your phone. Okay. You're like, well, I don't know if I could do that. Well, how free do you want to be? Make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. The list could go on and on, but I have five minutes and 34 seconds, so I can't do that. But I will say this, and I think I've already said it once, that you can't continue to supply what you're trying to defeat. Because what you feed grows and what you starve dies. Which brings me to the second point, which is feed your spirit by applying what God is teaching you. Feed your spirit by applying what God is teaching you. Information alone is not enough to experience transformation in our life. If that were the case, then Jesus would have given the biggest high fives and the most pats on the back to the Pharisees and the religious leaders in scripture. 
But instead, we find him consistently rebuking them. In fact, in one passage, he, he quotes uh, some Old Testament scripture and says that your lips declare me, but your hearts are far from me. Yeah. In other words, you have the ability to speak about me because you know a whole lot. But when it comes to the way you're moved, when it comes to your actions and the things that you do, because out of the overflow of your heart, the mouth speaks, at the end of the day, you don't really know me. At the end of the day, you've not been transformed by the message you claim to know so much about. Because the way we experience transformation is through knowledge plus application. It's coming into church and learning about God, but then going home and putting it into practice. It's why we talk so much about taking notes and why we think it's a great idea for you to do it. I like you to take notes. One, I think it helps me as a communicator, but two, I believe that it's powerful for your own life because you need to apply what God is teaching you. So when we talk about a message like temptation, you are going to experience temptation probably pulling out of the parking lot today, right? Like, come on, like there's gonna be times where you're gonna feel tempted. And as you go through that, you have the ability to go back and look, what is God? Hey, I need to change my appetite. I need to stop feeding my flesh and start feeding my spirit. And when Paul writes to the people in Hebrews, he says this, I love, Paul's a snarky author sometimes. And I love what he says. He says, look, you've been believers for so long that You ought to be teaching others people, but instead you need somebody to teach you again, the basic things about God's word. In other words, you've been in church a long time. You've been coming to church. You've been listening. You've been going through the motions and that's cool, except for the fact that God's system, kingdom economics is all about multiplication. So at this point in your walk with Jesus, you should have been in the place where you were teaching other people. Like you've been coming to church and you've been learning, but you haven't been applying it. Instead, we got to keep going back over the basic stuff because you're like babies who need milk and can't eat solid food. For someone who lives on milk is still an infant and does not know how to do what is right. Solid food is for those who are mature, who through training have the skill to recognize the difference between right and wrong. For some of us, Paul would say, hey man, you've been coming to church for a long time. You've been in church, you've been listening, but you're not growing because spiritually you're still like an infant. You're just living on milk. And spiritual milk, I believe, is God's word processed through one person and given to another. Moms, you know this, when you have a baby, you have milk and you deliver it to that infant. I think biblically speaking, spiritual milk is the same way. This thing that we're doing right now is milk. And for some of us, we come in and we listen to somebody teach on the week. And then the next time we eat is next Sunday. Or maybe it's not even next Sunday because the average person comes to church. This is for the church in America. And I'm not going like, let me tell you something about the average person in this church. They're not that aggressive, come on. No, the average person in the church in America comes to church twice a month. It's probably more like once every three weeks now, post COVID. What would it look like if you ate once every three weeks? You'd be malnourished. The same is true in our own walk with Jesus. So if this is milk, what is meat? Well, meat's something you have to hunt and kill for yourself. It's those times where we take the notes that we've received from God's word and we go home. I would encourage you, go home. Comb through each passage of text that we talk about on a Sunday morning. Ask God what is in the text that you need to apply to your life. Take the next steps. Do the work. That's what it looks like to start living on solid food. Because at the end of the day, you need a relationship with Jesus more than you need to live off of a relationship with your pastor. And if you're only feeding yourself on Sundays, you have a good relationship. You know, let, let me say this. You've become codependent on an individual instead of God. Because if they're not doing well, you're not doing well. 
And can I tell you, your relationship with God was designed to be way bigger than just how I'm doing every week. Oh, if the pastor don't preach good, you know, I'm, oh, I'm not getting fed no more. Can I be honest with you? Only babies cry when they're not getting fed. Adults get up and go make a sandwich. Come on, in Jesus' name. So we got to learn to eat. We learn to feed ourselves because it matters. It matters. So what are we going to do? We're, we're going to be tempted. There's going to be times where the enemy comes and he offers us temptation. We're going to change our appetite. We're going to start going, hey, God, obviously in my heart somewhere there's these desires. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deny those. I'm going to quit feeding those. I'm going to feed my spirit. I'm going to do what you're teaching me. I'm going to go all in. And then over a period of time, you're going to quit making excuses. You're going to keep feeding your spirit. And when you do that, you'll see that your spirit grows stronger and your flesh grows weaker. It's like you're getting spiritual reps in. And it's not that temptation becomes easier. It's that you became stronger because your spirit grew and your flesh weakened. So for some of you, that's your next step. But for others of you in here, here's what scripture teaches. That if we don't have a relationship with Jesus, we are still slaves to sin. There's nothing we can do on our own strength to overcome it. It's a hurdle. It's an obstacle that cannot be overcome through human intelligence or through a 10-step program. It has to be mended by a loving Savior who dies in our place who not only takes the punishment of sin for us, but takes the penalty and the bondage of sin away. And when we look at that Genesis chapter three passage where Adam and Eve are there and they've sinned, they've fallen short. At the end of chapter three, God actually kills an animal and covers them. He makes clothing for Adam and Eve ultimately to depict that one day through bloodshed, they would be covered. And that's what Jesus does for us. So even though they didn't deserve it in that moment, God covered them because he created them and he loved them. So despite every fault or flaw or failure you have, God loves you and he desires a relationship with you. And he already made the way for Jesus to die for your sin. So with every head bowed, every eye closed across the room today, maybe you're here and you're tired of being in bondage and captivity to your sin. The next step for you is to surrender your life to Jesus, to believe that he alone is the one that can save you. Maybe you've been in church for 20 years, but you've been relying on church attendance or good works or something else to save you. It is only Jesus Christ that saves us. And so with every head bowed, if that's you today and you say, Pastor, I wanna surrender my life to Christ, would you just lift your hand for a moment and say, hey, that's me. Come on. Here's what we're gonna do, church. Nobody prays alone, we all pray together. Will you repeat this after me? Dear Jesus, Today, I give you my life. I place my hope and trust in you. Thank you for dying in my place so that I could have new life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for checking out this week's message. If you made any decisions for Jesus or you need a next step or have a prayer request, let us know by going to www slash hub that leads you to our digital connect card where you can fill out all of that information as well as see what we have coming up here at propel thank you again for tuning in and we hope to see you again soon